ain't the same energy Work on being better when I'm 70 Your drip is just a water spring You know I drip different, just the seven seas I deal with life different, make that limit squeeze What's up, everybody, and welcome to The Edge. I'm Trey Griggs, your host. We're so excited that you are here with us today. We've got a great show today. It is Wednesday. hope you're having a wonderful middle of your week. Um, we normally talk a little about tech news on now because this is all about showcasing the latest in logistics technology. That's what The Edge is all about. And so I, I like to talk tech from time to time, but uh, we're not going to do that today. A couple things. First of all, I'm not in my normal location. I am on site here in Eugene, Oregon at my sister's cottage. She's got a cottage in the back of her house. This is where we're staying right now. And so we're, we're christening it. We're the very first ones to enjoy it. So that's really fun. We're out here in the Northwest. Going to be out of the house for about two weeks. So we're having a lot of fun. I hope that you are enjoying your summer as well. In fact, send us comments where you've been this summer or where you're headed this summer on vacation. We'd love to know where you're going and hope that you have a wonderful summer um, out there doing what you're doing. So instead of talking about tech and, and all the news stories that are going out there, and there's plenty of them, First of all, I would just encourage you to make sure that you come check us out on Friday at noon for Word on the Street because we're going to have an all podcasters edition with Lauren Began and Rommel Watley and Matthew Leffler and Chris Jolly and so many others. It's going to be a great show. And we're going to be talking about some of these issues in tech. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, what's been going on, the UPS potential strike coming up and all the things that are happening in the industry. So make sure you join us at noon central for Word on the Street, powered by Beta Consulting Group and sponsored by our friends at Greenscreens.ai, Inveo, and Isometric Technologies. But today... No tech news today. Instead, we've got an announcement to make. And in order to make that announcement, I got to bring my good friend up on the show. So please, everybody, give it up for my good friend from the Manair group, Wasim Manair. Everybody, Wasim Manair. Wasim, what's up, buddy? How are you? Hey, Trey. Doing great, man. How are you doing? Do you like this song? Do you like these these beats? Do you like this tune? I mean, I, I like it. It, it. like it gets you excited for it. I feel like I'm about to walk out of the locker room or something. So this is one of those songs back in the heyday where the beat was so hot, I loved it, but the words are terrible. So I, I don't, uh, I can't play the words, but the instrumental version is, is pretty fire. So had to had to play that one. That's kind of where we're at. Listen, you might be wondering, and the people watching the show might be wondering, what the heck are you doing on the show today? I think it's because we got a little bit of an announcement to make, my friend. But first of all, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Really appreciate you having me on here. We're having a good day, really strong day and strong week, and, and we're bringing a lot of energy. From Jacksonville, Florida, uh, coming to us. We're on the opposite sides of the country right now. I'm in Eugene, Oregon. You're in Jacksonville, Florida, but great. Could be further away. Well. <laughs> Could not be further away in the United States, more than likely, unless you were Key West and I was in Seattle. Maybe that. But outside of that, man, tell everybody a little bit about what you do at the Monair Group. For sure, yeah. So we founded the Monair Group in uh, February 2017. Been in business for about six and a half years now, and we are in the business of identifying talent, senior level talent, specifically in the supply chain technology space. So our customers are going to be either logistics service providers or companies that are building automation tools, technology for uh, for the supply chain space. So pretty, yeah. pretty niche. Yeah. Love that. And I got to meet you recently, got to do a little bit of work with you and uh, you're just a cool guy. I just realized, man, I got to I got to do some work with this guy and have fun uh, doing some stuff together. And so we came up with this idea. And so we got an announcement today to make on the edge. And that is that the Monero Group is the new title sponsor of the edge. Very excited. I, Thanks for having I know. I'm so excited about that as well. In fact, I think we should have some kids clapping or something. I don't know, but I'm excited about that. Good to have uh, you as the, the title sponsor of The Edge. There's your logo up there now. And here's what I'd say to everybody. Listen, if you're looking to grow your team, if you're in supply chain, especially if you're in technology, make sure you reach out to Wasim and his team over at ManeroGroup.com because Wasim, you just do tremendous work. I've had a chance to talk to your customers and uh, blown away by what they had to say about your process, how you work with them. How, like, What do you love about the recruiting process? What do you love about what you get to do every day? I mean, I get to make money helping people. What's better than that? You know, I mean, if you, I mean if you can make it, you got to put food on the table somehow, right? So if you could do it while, while making a difference in somebody else's life, that's pretty cool. And there's a lot of ways to do that. And, you know, I, I enjoy the process. I enjoy the wins. I enjoy coaching people to, to get to a place where they want to get to. And, you know, watching companies grow from a two, three person company to a 20, 30 person company or um, helping somebody take the next step in their career because they were able to hire somebody that was going to take their spot. All kinds of ways, but mostly just being able to to make a living and have fun and, and help people out at the same time. Yeah, I love the fact that you help these candidates find better opportunities, better jobs, which is cool. And you find help these companies to build a solid team that really lasts, cool. a team that's going to stick around for a long time. I know your retention rates are super high. And again, just absolutely thrilled that you are a part of what we're doing here at the edge and helping us to showcase the latest in logistics technology so thank you for sponsoring man thank you for being a part of that really appreciate that man we appreciate the opportunity it's going to be great 
Yep. Also, we got to talk a little golf. It is Open Championship Week over in, uh, in, in in the United Kingdom somewhere. I'm not sure if it's in Ireland or Scotland. It's Liverpool. Or Royal. Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool. Yeah. Again, I don't know where that is. It might be England. Who knows? I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, we, we see Roy uh, McIlroy just came off of a big win at the Scottish, Scottish Open. He's yeah. playing well. I mean, who you got? Who are you pulling for? You got a, you got a player? You got a Oh, man. Favorite? I think, I think you know, so I don't know. I think Ricky, I like Ricky. Uh, I like I like Brooks because nobody else wants him to win another major, but I do. <laughs> I, I just like his, I like his swagger, and you know, I want to. I want. I think it's pretty pretty clutch that you can show up six times a year and five times a year and, and win. Um, <laughs> but I think there's going to be a couple sleepers. I think there's going to be a couple sleepers. I'd watch out for Max Homa. Um, yeah, I think Adam Shank is a sleeper that a lot of people are talking about. It's all going to depend on the weather, right? If the weather is if the weather's clear. Um, yeah. Then I think whoever throws darts, your more traditional guys like your John Rahm and your and, and your your top guys. Um, but if if it's you know windy and rainy all four days, it's anybody's game. My dark horse is Cameron Young. We'll leave it at that. I like I like how he's playing. We'll see what happens. But any of those guys that win, I'd be happy. And Brooks especially, that guy's fire. So. All that said, man, again, thanks for being a part of the show. Thanks for sponsoring. We appreciate it. Going to do good things together, my friend. And again, for those of you that are needing help growing your team, especially in supply chain and technology, reach out to Wasim on LinkedIn or Maneirgroup.com and he'll help you out. We'll talk to you soon, my friend. Thanks for having appreciate me. I'll see you later. Love it. Love it. Love it. All right, everybody. So that is Wasim Maneir. He's a good friend of mine. He's a golf addict. So, you know, if you like to play golf too, he's a good person to have around from time to time. That's for sure. All right. So today on the show, I can't wait to announce who we have on the show today, because normally, as you guys know, we, we talk a little bit about logistics tech, about, you know, technology that's really helping freight brokers out. Today, we're going to focus on the carrier side of things. And I'm very excited to have our guests on the show today. I've known these guys for a while. I've seen their name and what they've been doing out in the industry. I've, I've heard their name from a lot of people. My good friend, Zach Shukart works over there. He's also a golf addict in case you like that. So you have to get with him. He's down in Atlanta. But these guys have been doing some tremendous work. They're helping carriers create efficiency with their fleets. We're going to take a look at it today. Whether you're a freight broker, carrier, or you know a shipper, this can be beneficial because it's all about moving freight and most effectively. Please welcome to the show, the CEO of Optimal Dynamics, and my new good friend, Daniel Powell. What's up, buddy? What's going on, Trey? How's it going? This is a good tune, dude. You're, you're, it's not you're, bad. Uh, your personal assistant rocked it on this one. Not gonna yeah, go we, we got to give Kenzie credit for this. Yeah, Kenzie did a great job. You yeah, can't, can't go wrong with Chili Peppers. This is the fun thing about all the shows I do is everybody submits their walk-up song, and I'm always excited to see what they come up with. And the moment I saw Red Hot Chili Peppers, I was like, okay, this is going to be fire show. I love it. It was, it was this or Enter Sandman, but it's summer, so a little more <laughs> chill summer. vibes is probably good. Wow, this, is, this is good. This is good. I, you can just imagine Red Hot playing at a, you know, an auditorium or a stadium somewhere, playing the song. It's, it's good stuff. Go. All right. Daniel, thanks for being on the show, man. Why don't you give a quick intro to who the heck you are and what you do over at Optimal Dynamics? Yeah, so Daniel Powell... Uh, CEO, co-founder of Optimal Dynamics. So, um, you know, my story is a little bit different than some, but I was born into logistics like many. It seems like to be an industry you just get born into and you never get to leave. <laughs> um, uh, my father had been working on these problems since the 1980s, since trucking got deregulated on how do you get a computer to solve a problem in the physical world. And the most interesting problem at that time was how do you, how do you route and make decisions on a truck a little bit more efficient? And roll that clock over 30, 40 years, that technology got pretty good. And so we work to sort of solve these types of problems in the market. So, um, you know, I wear many hats here at OD. The team's grown to a decent size at this point. Uh, but we effectively help carriers and shippers who run private fleets make better planning and operational decisions with their operations. Yeah. Um, so it's been and really I, exciting uh, to see our customers this, uh, these days. And I love the family aspect of your story that it was birthed out of growing up in the industry and kind of solving problems. You're not the first one that I've talked to on the show that's had a similar you know, experience where their, their mom or their dad or whatever their business was needed help you know, doing something. It's like, well, I'm sure we can figure this out. And then just slowly over time, they started to build technology or processes or whatever it was to really get that done. Let's talk about the real problem here, though. So why is this an issue for, for fleets out there? Why is this an issue for carriers? And why should the entire supply chain really care about this problem? Yeah, I mean, when you're looking at surface transportation, specifically on the middle mile, that truckload problem, until we have the ability to use a trans transporter, freight has to move through a truck at the end of the day. There's no getting around that. So how we broker it through our connections, a truck's moving at the end of the day. And if that underlying resource isn't planned in a more efficient way, planned in an improved way, 
And if these operators don't have the tools to drive that ball forward, what are we going to expect out of the industry? We can change all of the connection technology marketplaces, but if that underlying piece of equipment, that driver, that truck, that trailer are planned inefficiently, you know, there's only a ceiling. And so we're working on sort of that inner working mechanics to sort of unlock new efficiencies, new capacity within the market. How does this impact carriers financially? Like what is the, what is the, the big change? When they become more efficient, talk about what that actually means for their fleet. There's a financial side to it. There's probably, I would imagine, um, uh, a satisfaction side to it for the drivers and for the people. Talk about that. Yeah. Uh, I'm, you know, I think we'll get into the technology in a little bit in terms of a demo here. Um, when you look at our technology, it's a little bit different than typical classical technology that you may have seen for planning with a truckload carrier. Um, for quite some time, optimization or decisions meant dispatching a truck. Which driver takes which load? What's the closest driver to which load? Um, we're trying to sort of rewrite the book here. And we help our carriers with everything from year out planning decisions. How many trucks should they have? Where should they have them? What bids should they be bidding on? What lane should they be accepting? Down to what loads they should be accepting? What loads they should be moving on their asset network? And nearly every single one of our customers has a brokerage or logistics divisions as well. What loads should be moving on the logistics divisions? And then also sort of what drivers should be taking what load. And when you sort of really handle that from year out to day of planning decisions, you're not just changing costs by 2%. Um, we just did a webinar with a really exciting customer, BCB, uh, just last week. So I'll just bring I know it up. the guys, Rick, Rick Larkin, BCB. Can't, yeah, yeah, can't not know them. You know, their revenue per <laughs> truck a week is, is, is up more than 20%. And that's, that's a figure that carriers just don't see. And that's really sort of, you know, shows the impact of holistic planning onto a trucking carrier and the opportunity. So, so, so let's, let's dig into that for just a second. So sure. revenue per truck is up 20%. It's because the truck's being utilized more efficiently. Um, how is that impacting, you know, margin or, or operating ratio as, as you know, we, we call it in the, you know, on the carrier side of things. You know, how has that impacted that? So the revenue's up, which is great, but how is it impacting also, you know, margin on that? I mean, it goes right directly to the bottom line. Bottom line. Um, and so there's two things that really go into that. Load acceptance, load allocation, and execution on the dispatch. So if we just take 100 loads and try to dispatch them a little bit better, the, the opportunity's there. The automation's there. There's some efficiency there. But here's the sort of simple math for the, the industry. Let's take a carrier running 15% empty, and they reduce their empty models by 20%, a huge number. That's basically impacting their cost by 3%. It's not the opportunity right. that the people think they want out of it but you start picking the right puzzle pieces, the right loads that should be fitting into the puzzle and executing it correctly, then you can get these swings. So that 20% of revenue per truck per week is driving the 20% increase in profit, driving more money for the drivers, turnover's lower, profitability's higher, Rick's happy, drivers are happy, and it's a pretty amazing case study for the industry. Right, because everybody in that company knows that if that truck's going down the road empty, nobody's making money. You know, the, it's just it's burning money at that point. <laughs> You're burning a little bit money, but I will say, I can't stop saying this. Sometimes it's an opportunity. You know, you'll look at our software and sometimes we'll make a decision. Now, I would have never, I would never send that guy 200 miles empty, but maybe that one move sets that driver up for a week of success. Mm, so all yeah. about looking downstream. And so everything that we do, probably 90% of what we put our thought in is not how do we make better decisions today, but how do we make better decisions tomorrow, the day after, the day after that? Because that's yeah. really when you know, you get bit, bit in the back in terms of bad upstream planning. So it's not that deadhead miles are the enemy. It's that deadhead miles without a really good strategy behind it can be, can really be the enemy. Like there's, there's gotta be a deeper level of thinking starting to play chess instead of playing checkers as a truck. Yeah, driver. for sure. And when you're getting down to managing a resource, a truck versus a one-way transactional move, you got to think about what that driver is doing on the other side. You know, at the end of the day, if you're connecting a, a driver with a piece of freight, that's, that's fantastic. We're booking a business. They're making money. But that driver is now 500 miles away from home. And he needs to think about what's going to happen the day after that, the day after that. And so that downstream decisions is so important when you're managing an actual fleet. Um, yeah. The decisions they have to make every day. 
Yeah, so we'll talk about drivers here in just a minute. But for those watching the show, if you have questions, it's the time to throw them in the comments. We'll go through those throughout the show. Or if you have comments about what you're hearing today, make sure you throw those in the comments as we as we go through the, the conversation today. So let's switch over to drivers for a minute. So I know that Rick's happy, you know, at BCB because clearly he owns a company and he'd love to see a better OR and a little more profit. Those are all good things. But let's talk about the driver satisfaction because I'm convinced. This is I'm convinced of this. I don't really think that we have a driver shortage. I think we have a shortage of companies that treat their drivers well that take care of yeah. their drivers. You know, the companies that are taking care of their drivers, it's not a problem at all and never is. So talk about the driver side of things a little bit. Yeah, that's a really interesting topic. You know, there's a lot of different angles. Um, there's a lot of just being a good boss and a good person before you get to the technology. Just treating your employees right goes a really long way for drivers, for, for anyone. So there is that. And then when you look at a, a shortage you can look at it, is it a driver shortage or is it an inefficiency? How much waste do we actually have in the industry that could be resolved through better planning that would take the current driver's levels and allow us to execute at those levels? Um, and then there's driver retention. What do these drivers want to do? They want to work hard. They want to get back to their family and they want to get paid well. And that's a lot of what we do. We think about the future for them. We make sure when we're taking routes, they're getting them home. And hopefully more money to the trucking gear means more money to the driver. Um, you know, we've seen, that, we've seen decreases in driver turnover by up to, I think, one carrier, BCB, with 83%, which is incredible when you look at better planning and what that means to a driver's life. I'm muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think it's always important that we have to think about that because, you know, drivers... Uh, they have families, they have personal lives, they have things they need to get for. They have activities just like the rest of us. They've got graduations to get to. They've got birthdays to hit. They've got sports games they want to attend, a musical they need to go to. My daughter was in a musical last week, and I can imagine if I was on the road for the entire week and they couldn't get me back, like that would be um, that'd be brutal, right? I mean, that'd be hard to just not have not be able to do that. After a while, I'd be like, I'm done, you know? I'm not yeah. Right. And yeah. now if you're getting back home 96% of the time and you're making six days of work in five days, it's yeah, a pretty good gig. That's a that's a yeah. pretty nice uh, you know, promotion that you just got there. Yeah, um, exactly. I think every driver would take that. So optimizing creative efficiency, it's really good for the trucking company itself. Obviously, just for their bottom line, they can reinvest in, in newer trucks or better technology or things like that. But it's great for the drivers as well. I'd love to get a little view of of what this actually looks like. Are you able to give us a quick demo of that? We can jump in and take a look. Yeah. So let me go over share my screen. Yeah. Apologize. This takes a little bit. No worries. We'll get that. One thing I want to start here is I don't want to start at the driver level because I feel like when we go into customers, when we go into carriers, um, this can be the sort of misconception of like, all we care about is how we dispatch our trucks, right? We really try to elevate that, tech, that, that conversation up and we really had to bring a new class of technology to do so, but we, we can kind of put that off to the side. The first thing that's most important to a truck with carrier is the book of business that's coming in making sure the networks are balanced and looking one day, two days, three days, four days out in the future. So let's start here with this screen. It's a, it's a ridiculously simple screen, but it's very powerful and it'll work into our more automation focus. One of the things of our tool, it's called tactical procurement, enables our truckload operations to look up to two weeks into the future and proactively understand the network gaps that they may have. So they can go into our, our application. Let's say, let's go to Monday. And so now we're already looking at Monday. We're trying to see the network imbalances within our operation, and we can see that information. So within the tool, we can look at inbound, outbound, out of regions. This can be state or custom region codes if your carrier has that set up. You can see how much freight you already have available in your TMS out of that region. And then you can see the remaining freight that we forecast to happen. So we learn through machine learning about your demand forecast of your specific customers because every carrier is different. Every carrier, even if they have two of the same customer, their lanes, their demand patterns, their facilities can all have different behaviors. So we learn about each and every customer, how they receive freight. And so we know out of Texas, we have 22 active loads. And then we also know that we need between 14 and sort of 18 more loads out of that region. Between nine to 16 are probably gonna come from our named accounts. These are the accounts that we talk about every day you know, the Walmarts, the Targets, the, the, our, our biggest name accounts. And then we have four to six more loads that we're probably going to have to go to the spot market or sort of maybe a one or two opportunity. But this means that today on Wednesday, 
I can already start calling my customers to book that freight. I can go to my load boards, or I can go to my, my digital partners, book that freight into my network so that I'm not sort of reaching out to them day of. So I can address problems before I actually get to them. So that's the first component of the planning process, looking a week, two weeks out, making sure that we have our right loads tendered in, making sure our network's balanced. The next component that we get into is the load. Oh, sorry. Pause on that for just a second. So this is sure. pulling data from their TMS. Like it is, it's just looking at their stuff. It's not really tying into necessarily third-party platforms outside. It's just sitting on top of their TMS and providing more data and analytics and actionable and intelligence around that, correct? Yeah, we're a decision layer. We're not a brokerage. We're not a marketplace. We're not an ELD provider. So we integrate in a bi-directional two-way data feed from our TMSs. So any sure. actions... Any data that goes into the TMS gets positioned to us to make the decision. And then we can directly push those decisions back into the production. So all the data that's going into the machine learning model and the AI that's built into it is really just the customer data. You're not bringing in multiple layers of data to the, you're really just trying to affect their data, like what's what they're doing. The, the, there's other databases that we learn from, different market databases that we use to understand certain okay. decisions within the application. But it's critically important that we can have technology that can learn about their operation. Their drivers are unique. Their shippers are unique. And making sure we learn about the unique nature of those specific accounts, facilities, drivers, and attributes of the network is critical to make sure that we have a decision intelligence tool, right? Our applications aren't here for our customers to provide you know, a fancy wrapper for their legacy TMS so they can do just more kind of manual work. We're really trying to take the decision burden off of our operators so they can spend more time on winning business and doing people work, working with their drivers, working with their customers, and spend less time trying to solve the math problem every day. Yeah, exactly. No, I appreciate you sharing that. So go ahead and jump For back sure. into what you're talking about. Yeah, so the first screen is more of our proactive forecast of how does our network look one day, two day, a week out into the future. The next screen is our load allocation screen. So this is incredibly important, some of the most impactful decisions that a carrier can make. How this is set up today would be a carrier that had you know, logistics, which almost all of our customers have, a logistics service or brokerage and an asset carrier. And we're trying to think about how do we work up as a company as a whole? What freight that's on our asset network really shouldn't be on our asset network and really should be covered by our brokerage? And what freight on our brokerage really should be covered by our assets? Making sure you're getting that decision right and not just sending it to each division because that's what we always do can mean millions and millions of dollars at the end of the year for our customers. So just like all of our systems, we're able to pull all this data in from the TMS, all the ELD, blend it with what might happen in the future, all the uncertainties, and be able to give a driver, a, a load planner or a dispatch, that actionable information of what load should be moved into the asset or what load should be moved to the brokerage. You can also position the tool to be right after that, e that EDI uh, tender and so it can actually act as sort of that load acceptance, load reject strategy. So and when you with, say, yeah. when you say what might happen in the future, kind of trying to look at that, are you looking at past trends to predict some future behaviors, or are you actually taking into account that, hey, it's it's uh, you know tornado season in Midwest, it is you know whatever. Like, are you taking, are you factoring in weather events? Are you factoring in like what what, what all is going into that? What might happen in the future? Yeah, most of this is coming from what currently exists in our system today and what have we learned over the last three to five years of your account behavior. And then in addition, how does this interact with certain seasonality events? This could be holidays, weekend events, whatever they may be that might affect that sort of demand pattern with your, um, with your customer. We also have a you know, fairly large databases of traffic and traffic conditions at different time. But when we're looking five days out, there's definitely a lot of uncertainties that exist in the real world. And the tool does a really good job of learning these uncertainties and not having to predict a perfect future. So if you look at our load score, we can understand the likelihood of this being a successful load for our asset fleet, even if it is five days in advance. And so anything over, for example, you know, in this operation, over 70%, we would move that load into our asset network anything that's below that 70% threshold, we would move into our brokerage. And all the operator yeah. would need to do is click one load, accept all the changes, and now you've just made 50 decisions at once powered by the system. And this is really that empowerment of decision automation. And now they can move to working on customer service, working with their drivers, and working on pushing the business forward. 
So this is really interesting. So you have, I see on that, uh, the, op, the, the column, they're like the seventh column over optimized assignment. So you have switched to assets, switched to brokerage. So are you guys really specializing in those um, companies that have both asset and brokerage, or is it possible for just an asset specific company only to utilize this uh, and, op and optimize it that way? Yeah. So for this load acceptance, uh, we work with companies that just have assets that have asset and brokerage. We work with companies that are just moving trailers around um, in terms of power only networks. And so we work with sort of a, a nice breadth of, of, of customers. Um, and so it's not required, but it is a okay. huge advantage. And then even for companies who don't have specific brokerages or logistics, they can still make these decisions. And so in this case, for a company that is just running an asset network, they can go to the screen and proactively look at what loads they're going to have a hard time actually covering. So four days out, they get a load tender. So not surprised. Yeah. Exactly. We can go yeah. in and look at these zero values and just say, hey, we need to start thinking about this. Let's call our customer or let's think about our network, what exceptions we might have to make. Because as we're planning today with the freight we have, this is going to be a big loss for our company. But yeah. at least they're doing that four days out and not right. doing it a little it time to figure it out. Exactly. And, and these are the kind of problem. things that their team can spend more time on. I mean, these, you know, when you have these problems where typically you would just lose money on it and you just like, that's the cost of doing business. Now it could be, Hey, we got four days to try to find a solution that actually, you know, helps us break even or make money on this load. Exactly. And that's the yeah. people problem, right? We don't want to develop technology. Our applications are like icebergs, right? We don't want to develop technology that just enables a user to have a different interface and sort of interact with their network that way. We really want to empower them with the decisions for the majority and have them focus on the exceptions because yeah. that's where people become really powerful. Yeah. People yeah, are exactly. ter exactly. terrible at math, really good <laughs> at, um, uh, really good at people problems. Yeah. So let me ask you another question before we jump back in and take a more look at it. Sure. So I'm really fascinated about what you said about people that are moving, moving trailers. I'm seeing this more often in freight brokerage now where you have, um, trailer pools, you know, freight Vaughn is doing a trailer pool. Convoy's got a trailer pool. I know some others that are working towards the trailer pool. Loadsmith is doing a trailer pool. So would those companies benefit from something like this, from the trailer, like mon uh, monitoring their trailers? Yeah, it's actually a lot of work that we've been doing over the last year and into this last year is enabling those types of customers to leverage our platform. Um, it's the same sort of problem, right? When you work historically in the uh, just pure asset light world, we never have to worry or sweat about that we've now moved our own equipment from A to B. But now that these companies are purchasing equipment, which is a huge differentiator for them, for their customers, they now have to work about, worry about that resource problem. So now we've opened the door to a complex resource planning problem, which falls right exactly within our rear house. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so a freight brokerage that doesn't have assets per, per, per se, like it doesn't have trucks, but they're managing a trailer pool, something like this could help enhance what they're doing. I think the freight bond has probably built some of this a little bit because I know they've got their own, their own TTO, the, the, the Don Everhart that does that kind of stuff. But I'm sure that working with a third party could be beneficial for best, best in class. Have you been selling to freight brokers yet or has it still been primarily asset-based companies? We, we, we have, we have. Um, it's not something that you'll generally see on our website, but it is a lot of conversation that we've been having with the industry. Um, and yeah. Some that are going into production very soon. Right. help them better plan and operate their networks there. Yeah, and the trailer pools are definitely becoming more popular, it seems like. So I can see where that could be a, a, a huge benefit. All right, do you have a few sure. more things to show us here in the in the product? Yeah, let's let's go in. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the driver management. We'll just spend two minutes here. Um, and then there's definitely some fun releases that we're going in. We can move out of this, and then we can go into some of our planning technology as well, the cool. RFP bid, bid response. And so I just moved over here um, from the tactic procurement load acceptance. Once again, forward-looking planning automated load acceptance, load allocation, driving that big tactical decision for your business. Now it's time to dispatch, right? Now now it's the critical time to think about which driver is taking which load and really automating that process. And so like all of our other screens, we provide a really easy exception management screen to allow them to get through their day. And so that's with our other uh, platforms, you can go in, you can see which driver has a match to their load and you can quickly go ahead and assign that load and that load goes right back into your TMS and gets executed. And what's really cool about our technology as well, while you're not seeing this example in this demo, if there's multiple loads available, it'll string together tours. And what's getting released in about two weeks is that you'll now see tours for every option. So today, 
if you don't like that first load because of some reason, maybe there's an issue at that facility, maybe there's actually a real issue, you could easily go in, click a secondary match, and then the system optimizes in a split second. And so this allows us to actually inter interact with the optimization and not get blocked if there's an issue. Or if we do get blocked if there's an issue, we're not doing manual planning, manual assignments. There's always a second, third, fourth, fifth best issue. You can essentially reassign an entire tour to a driver because that first load didn't work. So let's get a new first load, which gives a new tour and it just assigns it out. Yep. Does and it look at driver preferences? Like, hey, this guy needs to be home by Friday or this, this, you know, whatever. Like, what does it look at? How detailed does it get in that regard? Models, every truck, driver, trailer, load, customer preference, type home preferences. Uh, this truck needs maintenance. Time. This trailer needs new tires that on schedule this day. Like it's, it's thinking when they all need to those be, little details. Where they need to be, their time at home schedules, even to incentivizing certain classes of drivers to maybe get more miles. Maybe we have a senior class of drivers that we want to, you know, favor a little bit more. They've been with our company for 10 years and we really want to make sure they're handled, right? And maybe our more junior class of drivers, you know, come second. They still both have the same HOS guidelines and everything else, but the tool can also enable our, our, our customers to say, hey, I get that, but we want to make sure these guys are taken care of first before these, you know, next class of drivers. And so we Does enable it get a lot of customization. Does it get specific to like, hey, this driver, we need this driver to, to haul the loads for this company or the, these, this pool of drivers to haul the loads for these, co these companies because they've got experience and they know and it, yep. it tailors to that. Yeah, so you can go in here and you'll see our driver rules. I think it might be coming under the, uh, the ad logo. So I won't, won't click it. It is. Um, oh, you, you can go you in. Click the logo, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, you can go in and, and click and um, uh, create rules that you want. So okay. you can create almost any rule in terms of, hey, this driver can't go to North Carolina. He just doesn't like it. He won't go. He won't drive up, <laughs> up north. Uh, or he has to be on this account because, you know, there's a dedicated account. He knows the people. He knows the facility. And so you can create hard rules yeah. above the optimization that will work around. Right. Keep, so keep the right that. drivers going to the right facilities. And, you know, maybe they, maybe there's a, a unique facility that only experienced drivers really would do well there or something like that. So. Exactly. But yeah. at the end of the day for, for this screen, uh, if I kind of stop sharing, it's, it's all about automation, right? It's all about decision automation. It's all about driving 90% of the decisions for our customers. So they're spending 10% of the time on the exceptions, driving that impact that we managed that we talked about earlier in, in, in the conversation and then spending the time on the people problems, which are very, very difficult for uh, computers to solve. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. All right. Hang tight for a minute. We got to pay the bills again. So, uh, to hold on just one second, but listen, everybody, make sure again, we want to say thank you to our sponsor, the Manea Group. If you are you know, looking to grow your team and need some help, they take the headache out of hiring and growing your team. Uh, make sure you reach out to Wasim Manea and the Manea Group at www.maneagroup.com. Supply chain and technology recruiting simplified. All right. Okay. Let's jump back in. All right. So uh, Daniel, talk, before we get into any more demos, let's talk about some more success stories because I love this. I think this is the biggest part. Obviously, what, what's happening with Rick Larkin and BCB is really cool. Are there any other success stories you can share with us of how this has impacted different segments, different customers, uh, that kind of thing? Sure. Um, we'll talk about planning technology in a little bit. So we'll talk about one that's planning. We have a co co company, Standard Logistics, um, had a really in incredible success story. So um Interesting time in the industry right now, but any company that's going through change, both booming or, or shrinking, it's really critical to understand how that change impacts your network. So this, this company standard was almost doubling or tripling the size of their fleet. And they were able to use our tool to understand where they should be hiring drivers, when they should be hiring drivers, and how that's going to impact their ability to cover their customer's freight. And they're able to I think, double the size of their fleet using our planning technology over the course of just a year. Um, and it's all about being able to solve those questions faster and having that data to make decisions. And that's really incredible. Yeah. So, so let me follow up on that. So if I have a customer, for example, that needs a delivery on Friday, every, every Friday in Cleveland, Ohio, then that might suggest to you guys that it'd be really great if you had a driver that lived in Cleveland, Ohio, that could drop off on Friday. He can be home on the weekends and then go do some other stuff. So you, it's able to actually say, hey, if you had drivers maybe in these regions, this would be more efficient. This would be more productive for, for your company. Is that right? Yeah, it, it does. And if I actually, using a good time here, if I, if I go back to my, um, 
screen, we can go ahead and see that. Uh, most of these companies are pretty complex. So it's easy to go ahead and say, we have this like one, one lane, one account. But then reality is we might have hundreds of drivers, dozens of drivers, thousands of drivers. And we need to understand how that driver is going to work with our overall network. Uh, networks can be quite complicated. They can have lanes moving all throughout the country with dozens of different shippers, shipper yeah. customers. So if you're and looking so, to hire a driver, you could almost look at your network, look at what you have and decide if this driver will be, if they'll be happy or not, if they're going to be able to help them out. Exactly. And so the really cool part about our planning technology. So when you look at our products, we have two products. Execute, which was the operational automation tool that we just saw. So that's that, you know, case study we just talked about with BCB. And then we have plan. So plan is all about asking those what if questions about your company. So it provides this sort of digital dashboard, which is a little bit more of like a business intelligence tool. However, there's a lot more to it because of its ability to simulate operations. So on the surface, you get all of the really cool ability to go in, look at all your accounts, look at all your lanes, look at all your drivers where we just were. But it also allows us to ask questions. So that question might be in a boom time, where should I add new drivers? But right now, it might be, what if our largest customer fired us because they're having a really um, you know, large reduction in volumes? We can go in and actually ask the system, what if we lost that account? And then we can rerun the simulation. And because this just isn't a business intelligence tool, we can actually take away that account, rerun it, and in 10 minutes, we'll understand the impact of our networks to our drivers, to our other customers, if we lost that book of business. And so we can so, start to war game situations before we ever yeah. actually get into them. I was gonna say, not only can you look at the what if situations, which is, which is powerful, but if a situation does happen, you can immediately make a change to the model and kind of have the actionary steps of this is what will help us to get through this. So this is what will help us to better use our drivers. This is how many drivers we have to maybe put on furlough for a little bit or whatever. I mean, whatever the, whatever the decision is, you get the information right away, whether it's simulation or whether it's reality. That's exactly right. And so those are the kind of critical data elements that we're giving to our customers. And so giving them not just a digital twin, but a digital twin that they can simulate and ask questions mean that they can come yeah to having you know data-driven decisions that can, they can apply in the real world. Yeah. Um, things get really expensive really quickly for an asset carrier. Yeah. And now, so by putting bad decisions in production it can cost you a lot of money. Now I have to ask about this. There's a lot of really cool features on this. Is your, is your subscription model all inclusive? Are there tiers and levels? Does, does the war games come with every subscription? How does this all work? Yeah, so we have a SaaS platform, a SaaS subscription. Uh, most of our customers, almost all of them, buy both applications. So a lot of my dog's barking in the background. There's a lot of uh, compounding effects because they all use the same technology. The decisions we do in plan can be pushed and execute, um, but you can splice them out. Uh, and really exciting that we'll be pushing out later this year is our pure dedicated RFP bid response tool. That will be additional SKU that will allow companies to get in at an even. Um, uh, uh, basically lower price point and be able to ask and answer the bids that they want to uh, on a daily basis. So, so with a bid response tool, cause this is really fascinating. Um, are you going to be pulling pricing from their historical? Are you gonna be partnering with some pricing tools. How, how are you going to be able to get pricing in there as well? Yeah. So we have market rate pricing, which is one, uh, we have historical pricing, which is another data source. Uh, and then some of our carriers uh, and customers have their own, homegrown pricing solutions that are sort of true to their core and their DNA, uh, we're able to pull that in. And mm, then okay. we can upload basically any file format. Uh, if anyone's seen an RFP, they come in every shape and color and <laughs> format and God knows what. Um, so you can basically upload whatever That's to the true. platform, map them. <clears throat> and then the key part here is not just pricing. So typically solutions on the market have just focused on how do you price a lane? But because we're a carrier, because we have capacity constraints, we need to think about how these lanes will impact our other customers, our books of business, and how it's going to work within the network. And so being able to actually inject these bids into your model and be able to see a tactical response back means that we can not only know what price to bid, but what lane to bid and how much freight we can actually cover, which is really the key components in a bid response. Yeah. 
kind of carriers today just don't have the tools. They just don't yeah. have the tools to know, really know what they're getting in. Bad planning by the carrier means bad response when they get the freight. Bad results. And then we'll overall, bad yeah. results. Yeah. Yeah. We'll tackle on the shipper side at some point, but there's a lot of people working on that side of the, the, yeah. the coin yeah. as well. Now, when you said you have market rates, are those market rates from all of your customers' data coming together? Or are you partnering with the green screens or somebody out there to, to pull that in? Yeah, we, we partner with um, uh, firms like truckstop.com uh, and DAT and uh, not DAT, a so sonar for, for our market rates. Um, and then we have historical rates and then provided rates. And so we allow our customers okay. to pick whatever they want. And then later this year, we'll be rolling out a feature that enables them to understand what is the minimum rate that they can move this load. Okay. So we have the market rate, but because we're running a network, we might be able to actually undercut the market because this lean is really good for our freight, freight flow. Yeah. So giving yeah. them that information of what rate can they actually go down to and still make it a good load for their network yeah. is incredibly powerful to those negotiations to have okay. that sort of hidden information that no one else does. Very cool. So you are partnering with some third parties out there, and, and I'm, I would assume some of your customers have accounts with those providers that they might want to tap in and see some of their data as well, or, or that kind of thing. Yeah, we're you know we're pretty data agnostic here. Yeah, uh, we're we're a decision framework, decision automation company, and so we don't really have much bias of what platform, what data source that our carriers yeah. would like. It's for Just whatever they trust. all of them and let them do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're the source of truth for the decision at hand, not what data they're using. That's up to them to kind of decide for us. Yeah, that's cool. That's good to know. Yeah, so that's coming. And now you're going to be launching. This is a new product you said in August or September. When is this coming down the pipeline? Yeah, so you could actually do it today. So if we flip over back to the screen, uh, yeah, we, can, yeah, yeah. we can show you a little bit. Uh, so today we can easily manage bids right within our application. We can go click add a bid and make it pretty easy. Uh, carriers have been able to do that now for you know over eight months, but soon we're able, we're actually releasing our bid manager. So we go and actually click on this. We now get a much more concentrated bid response view. Uh, I won't bore us with the file upload process. It takes a couple of clicks. We get the, uh, the bid into the platform and then we get a very sort of transactional view of what lanes they should be moving and at what rate. And it's like our load acceptance technology. And so now for the first time, we're not sitting here on an Excel sheet guessing what bid we should, what lane should we should bid on. We can actually look at how is this lane interacting with our network? What is the lane score? What are the lanes that really fit? What are the lanes that are sort of average and really enable us to focus our sort of response strategy to our shippers in a much more data-driven way? And this is a very transactional tool that they can just use each and every day. We're not doing big network planning problems just as our customers are sending us RFPs. Uh, and bids as we're going through the rounds, having that tool that's our source of truth so that when we follow this, we know exactly how it's going to go in the real world. Sure. So this and is being released to our customers right now and then uh, uh, being released into the open market in probably about a month. Nice, nice. And and for this uh, tool, it's still factoring in the assets, where they want to go, where the drivers are, and hours. Of, it's factoring everything in as they think about pricing, as they th think about it. It's all going into the model. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing of what we do. All of our technology uses one decision tool. So the same decisions that we're making on dispatching, load acceptance and planning have the same objectives and constraints that we set out. So our, and we're not in this awkward, God, how many times do you see where you have this great plan and it's just so disconnected with how reality operates or we have this black box reality and no way to plan it. Um, and so we really try to break down the barriers between planning and execution above just making better decisions. Because we feel when you can do that, that's where the real opportunity kind of can come, um, come, come to fruition. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Okay, well, this is your demo here. So what else do you want to show us? What else is it that we need to know about? What's coming on the pipeline? Yeah, um, so this is the next big thing for us, um, and big is simple for us, right? We've done a lot of work to have the right decision intelligence behind the scenes, so that we have the right uh, uh, decisions that are going to our carriers. So providing a really simple, easy interface for them to respond to their bids is the next thing that's coming out to the pipeline. Um, and then what I won't show today is our trailer management, trailer management solutions. And so those are going to be coming in uh, Q3, Q4 this year. Um, for you know, wide release within our customers uh, in terms of more encompass planning screens. So today we already have all the planning screens today uh, in terms of load acceptance, load allocation, dispatch decisions, but we're doing even more on the planning screen with our trailers. Yeah, um, yeah. coming in the future. 
Do you see this as, you know, the tools that you're putting in place obviously create a lot of efficiencies for people uh, in these chairs, whether it's a dispatcher or somebody who's bidding on freight or whatever it is. Do you see these tools as someday being able to just make the decisions and not even really need confirmation that they're just like, hey, we know this is best. Like, we don't even need you to tell us. Like, we know this is the best. We're just going to make the decision. And then, like, what? how far do you think this is going to go? Uh, I, I, in my opinion, and... Um, I believe we sent it out today or sending it out this week, entire um, press release on, on change management, um, really thinking about how our team members' jobs are going to be impacted with the advent of decision, inte decision intelligence. Um, what I think we're going to happen is we're going to really see a shift of not manage the majority, but managing the exception. And so we'll have 80% of these decisions done fully automated dispatching the trucks, accepting loads, allocating business to the right, you know, business units. And then we have people managing the sort of edge issues that are just really difficult. We're getting to the point with some of our, you know, most successful customers that, you know, we're starting to have some of these types of conversations uh, and that exists today, right? Th these technology applications, certain ones are getting so robust that they really can start to take a lot of the burden off the human decision maker and really allow them to focus more on exception. So I do really see that path kind of yeah. um, coming, to, coming to fruition probably the pretty near future. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And it's interesting. We're going to have, you know, shippers that are going to adopt some AI technology and automation technology. You got carriers who are going to do that. You got brokers. And all these platforms are just going to start talking to each other and working together as opposed to people working together. I mean, I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's fascinating to think about uh, how it's going to work, where all this could just kind of almost just happen. Like my grocery store has to know how much toilet paper they need to buy and how and when they need to have it. There's there's no there's no guesswork about that at this point, you know. So it's t it's taken more time. But if you look at look at uh, the the finance world, Wall Street, it was all of the same stuff. Traders on the floor yelling, screaming, booking, you know, slips of paper. Right. Go on our trading rules. floor. Right. Doesn't exist. Right. It's just it's empty floors happen. of computers. Right. Uh, and then people focus on the deals. They focus on the business. They focus on the personal aspects. Yeah. Supply chain logistics, much more complicated. It's the physical world. It's taken, you know, an additional 20 years longer. Um, but I do think it'll get more like that where people are focusing on the books of business and their customers and not transaction operational decisions, these math decisions every day. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with all of that. We'll, we'll see how far it goes, but it's exciting to see what you guys are doing for carriers um, I, I'm just, I'm fascinated by it. I love what you guys are doing and I love your company. Everybody I've met from Optimal Dynamics has been cool. So whatever, you know, whatever you guys are doing over there, you know, keep up the great work. I do have to ask you a couple of questions. So first of all, are you a water bottle kind of a guy or are you a more of a coffee mug kind of a guy? We want to send you some swag. Oh, look at that water bottle. That's it. Well, you already have one. Do you want one or do you want a mug? What, uh, what do you I would love, um, I, hmm. I'll take a water bottle. I'll take a water bottle. I got, this, I got this, enough coffee mugs. This is a fire water bottle. I'm not going to lie. They're really good. I do like that. Oh. So, we'll, we'll, okay, we'll get you a water bottle. We'll send it out. That to you and right. the coffee. So, I, yeah. I, 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 need, both. <laughs> I need both going through my veins to keep working. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll send you, uh, we'll send you a, a water bottle just to say thank you for taking the time to be on the edge today. A few other questions for you, real quick. Uh, who has the best pizza? You're a New York guy. Does New York have the best pizza or Chicago? Oh, no, definitely New York. Uh, it's Ruby Rosa <laughs> for me. Ruby Rosa. Is that, is, okay, is that a restaurant? Is that a location? It's Ruby like, Rosa. It's a rest, and Ruby what's Rosa, your, your go-to pizza there, Ruby Rosa? Oh, uh, they have a um, tie-dye. I think I call it tie-dye pizza, which is basically like a margarita pizza, but it's like a yeah, pesto okay. tie-dye. It's amazing. Anyone who comes to New York, go. Just wait for 20, 30 minutes. It's, it's incredible. Well, we're going to be there in six months, so I got to remember that. Ruby Rosa tie-dye pizza, yep. that's, that's going to that's gonna be fire. Okay, cool. All right, our golf or tennis? What would you prefer to watch on TV? Golf or tennis? uh probably golf okay really okay did you watch wimbledon last week on sunday it's fat it's a five-hour match it was unbelievable in the background a little bit but that's that's too much for me i can't <laughs> but it, it's golf okay so are you gonna be watching the open then uh this weekend uh, i possibly i was gonna yeah, go out yeah. hiking and try to get onto a trip i need to get out of the city so that's uh we'll, we'll see Okay, so next question. Where do you go when you leave New York? I mean, New York's crazy. I know people go all over the place. Some people go to Long Island. Some people go upstate. Some people go to Pennsylvania. Where do you go to get away and what do you do? Um, we like I, – I got two dogs sleeping next to me, so we like to go hiking a lot. So probably most weekends we go up to the mountains or uh, there's, something, there's a place called Harriman State Park uh, in, in the New York area. Um, it has great hiking. So we're, we're up there most weekends just, you know, out of nature. Nice. 
Nice. That's awesome. Last question. What is the number one item on your bucket list today? What, what, what do you got to do? Oh, bucket list. Um, I still haven't been to Japan. So Japan, go to Japan is, is right now on the bucket list in terms of travel. I don't know. I, I try not to kill myself. So nothing too crazy on the adventure side. <laughs> Japan will be fun though. Uh, it's, it's a long ways over there. It'd be a good time to go that way and see that. Uh, okay. How can people follow you, connect with you and uh, learn more about optimal dynamics? Yeah, follow us on LinkedIn. We're pretty active. We try to do a ton of education. Um, so we have, a, we have a good LinkedIn page, with quite, quite a lot of followers. Um, and then you can always go to optimaldynamics.com. Um, don't be shy, reach out. We, you know, we, we're always trying to kind of educate what we're doing and you know, bring an awesome product to the industry. Yeah, and my buddy Zach Shukart works there. Can you beat him in golf? Are you as good as him in golf? I, no, I can't. I, I used to be a single digit golfer, uh, which I still couldn't beat Zach in that case. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm yes, even yes. worse now that I decided to start a company. Um, <laughs> that's that's awesome. We we played uh, we played in an event probably uh, back in April before TIA, and uh, we didn't play together. We played in different groups, but we literally pushed. I was like so disappointed. Like. It's like kissing your sister, man. It's no fun. I wanted to win or lose <laughs> that guy, but we tied that day. So I'm, oh, I'm thankful. I think he just had a go. bad day. I'm there really thankful he had a bad day, which is good. Daniel, thank you so much for being on the edge today. We appreciate that. Excited for what you guys do in Optical Dynamics. And, uh, you know, we'll talk to you real soon. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. All right, everybody. Listen, we got a great show next week, but we appreciate you guys being a part of it. Enjoy this walkout song by the Red Hot Chili Peppers as we get out of here. We will see you guys next month in August for The Edge. Peace out. Talk to you later. On track, now we gon' way up Don't be used as easy as a layup Fuckin' late, stay up, stay up Countin' all the way up Count blessings, yeah, you know we pray up Way up, hurry up On track, now we gon' way up Different, just the seven seas. I deal with life different, make that limit squeeze. Went off for my style.